Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Tara Kieran. I'm a family doctor at St. Michael's Hospital and the vice chair for quality and innovation at our department of family and community medicine at the University of Toronto. I'm delighted that our department can continue to bring you these sessions together with the Ontario College of Family Physicians. And I'm gonna turn it over to their president, Mahalai Kuminen, to introduce the session. Mahalai. Thanks, Tara. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's so nice to be here with all of you. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to thank our panelists. We've got a really fun session lined up that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, and just a reminder that this is a main pro accredited session and you'll receive details by email. Next slide. So moving on to our land acknowledgement, uh, we acknowledge that the lands on which we are hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. The OCFP and DFCM recognize that the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well being. The OCFP and DFCM respect that Indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite all of us to reflect on the territories we are calling in from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship, and contributing to reconciliation. And I'm calling in from Kitchener, the lands traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Chenong Tong. Um, just as a reflection, I wanted to um, draw your attention to this article. So it's an article about the housing crisis in the Ottawa Piscot First Nation on the coast of James Bay. Um, and in this article, the chief um, comments on the um, housing crisis that they've been facing because they've not um, been able to, to gain enough land because their reserve is landlocked. Um, and there have been political challenges that have not helped them to address this, this issue. So essentially, they're dealing with a humanitarian crisis that involves homelessness and has contributed to the mental health crisis, um, as well as challenges with, with addiction within the community. So for me, as I reflected on this article, it was just a really good reminder of how critically important the social determinants of health truly are to the health of a community. And I think important, it reminded me how important it is for us as healthcare providers to be advocates for our patients and for the communities around us and to speak up against the injustices that Indigenous people within our province continue to face. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Mahalai, for that. Um, just a reminder to everyone that uh, our sessions are recorded and the recordings along with the Q&A and the resource lists are available on our website. Uh, and a big thanks to the planning committee who continues to, to lead um, the planning of these and select the speakers. Always open and welcome, actually, your feedback. Next slide. Um, so we're delighted to have two amazing speakers today. Next slide. Um, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves soon, and thanks to our co-hosts, um, Hale and Liz. Next slide. Uh, so Janine, over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you, and uh, thanks for having me again. Um, so my name is Janine McCready. I'm one of the infectious disease physicians at Michael Guerin Hospital, formerly Toronto East um, in Toronto. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and hopefully answer some of your questions today. Thanks. Thanks, Janine. Sarah? Good morning, everybody. I'm Sarah Smith. I'm a family physician out in Alberta. Um, I have a number of places that I speak and get paid for speaking each year, but main conflict of interest is that I have a program called the Charting Champions Program um, that physicians can join. Thanks, Sarah. Mahalik? Hi there, everyone. Um, my name is Mehle Kuminen. I'm a family physician in Cambridge, and I do receive a stipend for my role as the president of the OCFP and uh, the chief of family medicine at the Cambridge Memorial Hospital, uh, neither of which poses a conflict today. Liz? Uh, good morning from Ottawa. I'm Liz Maga, family doctor here, and uh, I am the senior clinical advisor for primary care at Ontario Health and receive um, uh, stipend for that work that I do at Ontario Health. Thanks. And I'm Tara Kieran, and I've listed here um, some honoraria and research support uh, and grants that I've received, but none of them pose any conflict for today. Next slide. Um, so just a reminder to please put your questions in the Q&A. That allows us to keep track of the questions better, and it allows us um, to uh, enable you to use the upvote function. So, you know, when, when you upvote another person's question, it goes to the top and those are the questions that we prioritize um, for the uh, 
uh, COP. Of course, we um, appreciate all of the comments that you put in the chat in terms of sharing your own experience, your reactions. Um, that community connection, of course, is what makes it special. But if you can put your questions in the Q&A, that's terrific. Next slide. Um, and just uh, in terms of the outline for today, we'll start with Janine, and uh, she'll be giving us an update on, on COVID, where we're at, uh, talk a little bit about boosters and masking, and then we'll go to your Q&A, your questions of, that relate to COVID. Um, and then in the second half of the session, we'll turn to Sarah Smith, who's going to take a different tack, and we're going to talk about our own offices and um, administrative kind of workflow and charting, and look forward to lots of discussion and questions then too. Next slide. So Janine, over to you. Perfect, thank you. So I wanted to kind of give a practical guide for um, all of you and answering your patients' questions and answering your own questions, since a lot of the assessment centers and a lot of the funding and, and extra supports related to COVID kind of ended at the end of March. So um, this is kind of, I always start with this, like where are we at? So we used to have kind of lots of different measures every day. We'd hear how many on the news, how many hospitalizations there were, how many people were in the ICU. You'd, you know, we'd have much more testing in the community. So we'd have a positivity rate. Most of that has gone away. We still do, do know about hospitalizations and ICU admissions um, and outbreaks in long-term care and other facilities, but you kind of have to go searching for that. So hard to find that information and something that is more readily available, or at least with the you know Google and a click of a button is our wastewater signal here in Ontario. Um, and they have decided to continue with the wastewater um, monitoring for at least the next year. So we will have that data available. And so you can see we've had you know, peaks and not so deep valleys, kind of a consistent level of COVID over the last several months. And seems things seem to be stabilizing out um, at this consistent but low level. I think everyone's hoping that over the summer things will go down a bit and then we will likely see some increase in the fall. But this is a, a place where if your if your patients are are you know tech tech savvy and they can go on the internet and check or if you're interested in checking you can follow this website uh, go to the pho website look at the wastewater and then it actually breaks it down by region so you can see if your region is increasing decreasing stable uh, just to give you a sense of, of where things are at next slide so what I really wanted to talk about today, because I think a lot of it, a lot of people have questions, well, who's high risk? What do I do if I'm high risk? What if I do if I'm not? Because, um, you know, inside the hospital versus outside the hospital or in your, in, your, um, in your clinics versus out in the world, people are, most people have kind of moved on and want to live in this post-COVID world where we don't care anymore. But some people it still affects and we are unfortunately still seeing some people admitted to hospital. So who are those people and who do we need to still be worried about having poor outcomes from COVID-19? Who do we need to be worried about getting very sick, potentially dying and ending up in hospital? So age is still the kind of most important factor. Um, you know what? They're probably over 60 or 65 it, that risk increases and, and in combination with how many comorbidities the person has. So, you know, as we see people over 80, their risk is obviously going to be higher. But if you have a very healthy 60 year old or sorry, a very healthy 65 year old versus a 60 year old with multiple comorbidities, that person's still going to have um, a risk to have, you know, increased uh, poor outcome from COVID immunocompromised. So if people are kind of moderately to severely immunocompromised from COVID, even if they've had all of their vaccines, the vaccines likely are not going to work as well in them. So they're still going to have a higher risk for poor outcomes. Um, then people that are living in long-term care, congregate settings, generally they're older, more frail, more vulnerable, more comorbidities, and also have difficulty kind of controlling their environment. So they're going to be higher risk as well. And then at, at this point, people that are still unvaccinated or undervaccinated and or undervaccinated or unvaccinated and don't have any natural or uh, native immunity, those people are going to be um, at higher risk. So it's kind of a, a combination of, of these factors that when you're counseling your patients, you know, do they need to be worried? Next slide. So there's the person and then there's the activity. So things are obviously very different than they were a year or two ago. So, you know, back at the beginning of this, hugging a friend was like licking a subway pole and flying was like French kissing everyone in a subway car and then licking a pole and then licking the floor. So we're not there anymore. So things are a lot different. And, and you know, the risk has definitely changed because we do, as we talked about, we have different levels of immunity from vaccines and also from a large percentage of the population having 
COVID already. Um, and also from uh, basically having tools. So we have antivirals like Paxlovid and Remdesivir. Um, and we also have tools like masking to protect ourselves in these settings. So things have really changed from where we were at and literally going flying was like French kissing everyone in the subway car and then licking the pole and licking the floor. So both the, you know, the person's risk, but also the risk of everyone around you that now if you go somewhere, not everyone is going to have COVID at the same time because we all have different levels of immunity. Next slide. Um, so if you if you do have patients that are higher risk, so older individuals with potentially immunocompromised, um, then those people, the, the best advice, and those are the ones to really focus on to, to, still, to still make them, you know, care a little bit about COVID, not enough to change their, you know, lifestyle and still want people to be able to participate in the activities they want to participate in, spend time with their grandchildren, do all those great things, but how can they do it, you know, as safely as possible so that COVID isn't going to at this point after they've been so careful and so good for three years, so it's not going to cause a significant impact on them now. So number one, keep up to date on their COVID vaccines. And we'll talk about that in a second. But as, um, as most of you have probably seen, NACI did recommend spring boosters for, um, for individuals that are older or in immunocompromised. So keep up to date with those. Yearly influenza vaccines, pneumococcal vaccines. We saw um, with any virus, we often will see uh, post-infectious um, bacterial pneumonia, and th those can actually cause pretty severe outcomes and end up with people in hospital. Um, still avoid people that actually have active viral infections. So, you know, before the, be before the pandemic, people would kind of, you know, I still have a little bit of symptoms, you still get together with people. It's still best that if you're sick, you know, stay home. Don't go hug grandma and give her whatever you have, because even if it's not COVID, you know, we, we do, we, fortunately, we didn't see very many elderly people admitted with flu or um, human metanumavirus or all those other viruses in the last two years, but we certainly did see them this winter when there was more viruses circulating. So still a good idea to, you know, not go spend time in close contact with people when they have active symptoms. Still masking um, is, you know, recommended, especially for high-risk individuals in an indoor crowded place with poor ventilation. Um, and if you have symptoms, actually still test and then discuss with you guys, their healthcare provider or pharmacist, and then discuss whether Paxlov is appropriate for them. So I think just even having that conversation so that people are aware that they would be potentially eligible for Paxlov and they should seek attention early is important because I know the most heartbreaking thing for, for us and that I've seen a, a few cases now is people that got COVID, had, had symptoms early, but their symptoms were quite mild, but they were immunocompromised, but they didn't seek any medical attention, they just did a rat at home. And then they came in about day 10 or 12 with actually you know, difficulty breathing um, and ended up having quite poor outcomes. And by that point, there's not a lot that we can do for them. So still telling people that you know that it's important if your immune system's not normal or you are in those older groups, that perhaps it's something that we can done early that can prevent you from ending up in hospital. Next slide. So in terms of the booster guidance, so this just came out um, at the beginning of March. So NACI had, um, has recommended just for um, the, these higher risk individuals that an additional dose of COVID-19 vaccine can be given six or more months from their last dose or their, or their last infection for higher risk people. So if people did get a dose in September or October, they could get uh, another booster dose now. And the recommendation is really for all individuals over 80 years of age. And for those individuals in the 65 to 79 years of age, if they, those people are also would be eligible. So, you know, if you have a perfectly healthy 65 year old that has had COVID three months ago, they wouldn't necessarily need to get the booster now. Um, but for anyone that hasn't had any history of COVID that they know of, would definitely recommend it for those individuals. And if they're in that the 65 to 79 age group and they have comorbidities, again, there would be likely quite a big benefit or be a benefit for them as well. Um, in addition, adult residents of long-term care homes and other congregate living settings and those with complex needs. Um, and then again, our individuals that are over 18 with moderate to severe immunocompromise or underlying conditions. And so the, there's, there's actually kind of one good study out of the States, lots of other research going on that showed that in these individuals that got a second dose that were 
over 65 years old and they got a, another booster dose, it actually did show a decreased risk of hospitalization. So there is some data that not only does it just boost your antibody levels, which there's lots of, lots of, of evidence for that, it actually decreased the risk of hospitalization in these individuals. So that's why um, NACI has made this recommendation. Next slide. And then for everybody else, if people have not had COVID or, or everybody else above five, I should say. So if you have not had COVID and not had a booster dose since September 1st, 2022, then it um, has been recommended that those people get another dose of uh, a booster now. So if you, you know, if you had had only two doses or you had your third dose last January, then a good idea to get another booster now. Um, and then in terms of going forward, you know, we're, again, NACI is still monitoring the evidence and all, all of us are you know, looking at new studies. It, it's, a, it's a bit early to know what the impact of that booster is on the younger populations because the risk of them being hospitalized is so low and a lot of people have hybrid immunity at this point. But the, the thought is that potentially there'll be another recommendation for a, or an offering at least of a booster dose in the fall, um, likely preferably to align with the flu uh, vaccine so that people could get those together, especially if they're in higher risk groups. But time will tell, and that's just my crystal ball that doesn't always work quite right, but that's our, our kind of our thoughts um, looking ahead. Next slide. And then what if people actually have symptoms? So you've done all this good stuff, you wear your mask, you avoid sick people, but guess what? You wanted to go out to have dinner with your friends and unfortunately you have symptoms and you haven't done anything wrong and you know that's, the, that's where you're at now, but what should people do? So, you know, you're, if, you're, um, if your patients or your loved ones have symptoms that are possibly due to COVID, I think the first question at this point in the pandemic is, are they at higher risk of being hospitalized? Are, those, 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 are they the higher risk individuals we talked about? If they're not, then they should stay home. So stay home until they're improving for at least 24 hours, 48 hours if they have GI symptoms and their fever is resolved and they're not getting any new symptoms. So then at that point, they're allowed to rejoin society, but they should still wear a mask for the full 10 days when they're out and about in public um, and avoid high-risk individuals. So again, don't go hug grandma and give her whatever you have. Uh, and certainly rapid antigen tests are still available for, um, for low-risk individuals. So I'm happy to recommend for people to do that, but they don't need to go seek out a PCR test. They don't need to be overly concerned or, or, um, or get pass of it. Um, but still important to try and not pass on um, COVID or influenza or whatever they have to other, other individuals. And then if you are high risk, then people should do a rapid antigen test. And if the rapid antigen test is negative, because it often is early in the illness, they should repeat it um, daily and then try to get access to a PCR. So depending on where you are and how your practice is set up, you may or may not have access to PCR um, through your clinic or through you know, an alpha lab or something nearby. And then on the next page, I'm gonna show you a little link to, to where people in their area can find um, access to a PCR test. If they are positive on either a rapid antigen or a PCR, or if they have symptoms um, and they have a known exposure to someone that's positive, I think at this point that's enough um, given the limited testing, then speak to them or refer them about talking about Paxlovid. So uh, in a second, there's also a slide on the can treat COVID study. So people, you guys can refer them to there if you think they'd be eligible and interested in Paxlovid. You can discuss it with them, prescribe Paxlovid, or refer to a community pharmacy who should be able to also prescribe Paxlovid to them. Next slide. So these are just a couple links of where to actually find rapid antigen tests and where to get tested with the PCR if you need it. So the first one is a rapid, uh, rap rapid antigen test locator. And I actually tried it for my area. So you can go in, put in your postal code and it'll give you the local pharmacies uh, that are giving them away for free still. Um, and then the second link is to uh, locations for either assessment centers or um, labs that are doing, um, that, are, that have the PCR testing available that you can send your patients to. And obviously a lot of the assessment centers has closed and this may evolve. So, you know, check back if you recommend someone to go somewhere. If it's a few months from now, I'd, I'd look again to see if you, they, that, that place is still um, open. And then the last link is just the Ontario government COVID treatment screener. 
on that one, it's very easy to qualify for COVID. Basically, if you are you know, over 18 and you smoke, you, it says you qualify for Paxlovid. So I think that you, know, you may want to have a bigger conversation with your patients, but if someone comes to you and is very keen uh, to get Paxlovid, then, then obviously worth, worth a conversation. Um, yeah, and I, I see someone posted that the website's likely out of date because most clinics closed on the 31st, but I actually did look at it again and because I wanted to see if our hospital was still on there and they've actually removed a lot of them that have closed. So it's mostly like Alpha Labs and, um, and a few special clinics that have stayed open. So um, good point, but that's why I say check back, you know, in the next few weeks because it may, more of them may actually decrease. I think there's still some funding for some of them till the end of June and then um, it'll be through more lab-based places that are still offering the testing. Next slide. So this is just information about the can treat COVID study. Um, and I don't know too much about it, but I know you guys had an amazing talk about it a few weeks back. So you can refer your patients uh, to this study if they are eligible and interested in uh, taking Paxlovid and they either you can refer them or they can actually self-refer. So great resource. And also it'll help to lead to our understanding of when is of it actually helpful um, and who should we be focusing on. Next slide. The last thing I wanted to touch on, because uh, I know there's probably lots of confusion and I'm probably not going to be able to fix that confusion, um, but there was new guidance that came out from PHO on masking. I shouldn't say healthcare, I should say more in acute care settings or in hospitals, um, but it does mention that it can be applied to other um, non-acute care settings but it wasn't specifically for uh, outpatient community-based settings. So not specific for, um, for most of your clinic-based settings. I think the main thing that uh, this document is trying to capture is that, you know, the, the, the seasonality is really uncertain at this point, and we don't know what things are going to look like. But as we talked about with immunity, with community incidence changing, with the disease severity changing, they're trying to come up with kind of a way out of this so that we don't, um, we aren't having people having to mask indefinitely in all of the settings. So basically the, the kind of the matrix is looking, looking at this high versus non-high risk and, and how do we figure that out? So going back to that first slide, it's looking at outbreaks, hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and then the wastewater. Um, so I think on an individual clinic level, it's almost impossible for, for each of you to have to figure out you know, where you're at and, and to worry about that. And I think for, again, um, in a practical sense, you have that advice from back in October. And I know the uh, OCFP put out a nice uh, kind of cheat sheet or guidance document for that. So I think reasonable to just keep following that for now until something new or specific comes out where masks are not mandatory in your setting, but still recommended. And just to give you a sense of what Toronto hospitals are kind of expected to do, um, I think as of next week, the Toronto IPAC hub people uh, have, have kind of declared that Toronto hospitals are in a moderate level of COVID. And so they're no longer going to require masking in non-clinical, non-patient facing areas. So if you're in the finance department or in HR, um, and if you're in clinical, but non-patient facing areas, so pharmacy departments, labs, all of these uh, understanding that you're not in a crowded space, that you're able to kind of physically distance from people. And then in meeting, conference, and gathering rooms that are not located within inpatient units or patient care areas. So if people are doing bullet rounds a date adjacent to a ward, still expected that they wear masking. So really in non-patient facing areas, that's where masking is going to be now um, kind of optional, basically. And then masking will still remain mandatory in hospitals in all clinical patient facing areas all meeting rooms contiguous with patient areas. And then I think the hospitals are kind of doing different things about common areas within the hospital. So hallways, elevators, most of them I think are still maintaining masking in those areas, um, but we will um, we'll probably see some change. And I think this is really the first step to see how people are comfortable in it, to make sure we're not seeing outbreaks and to see how the COVID levels go over the next few months. And I think the kind of the thought or the expectation over the next several months and or years that potentially COVID will move into a seasonal pattern where you know, once we see um, other viruses and COVID increasing in the fall, then we may, when we turn on all the testing for all the different viruses, we'll also basically go back to, to masking all the time in the, in the in a acute care setting in the hospital. But again, uh, you know, expecting more guidance in the fall as we see how things happen over the summer. 
And um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, just to give you guys a quick update in terms of kind of occupational health and return to work, if you're trying to figure that out for your settings too. So in hospitals now, most of it is now moved to, um, you don't, it's not mandatory to test, still recommended or allowed, but again, PCR testing is more restricted. So um, recommending that people, if they're sick, they stay home, they can return to work, you know, once they're feeling better, those things we talked about earlier, um, but they do need to be in work self-isolation. So basically wear a mask, not be unmasked around anyone for, uh, for 10 days from when their symptoms start, even if they return to work. And then obviously getting in touch with off health and discussing if they are in touch with obviously higher risk or immunocompromised kids, reevaluating that, um, that timeline. Um, and I think that's next slide. Yeah, so this one, I just like this slide. This one's, this one's dedicated to all the people that didn't believe in me when I was just getting started. So I remember all those conversations that seemed like a lifetime ago where people were like, I was like, oh my gosh, the world is ending. And the people thought I was just bonkers. They were like, what are you talking about? This is no big deal. I was gonna call my uh, financial advisor and tell him to pull my money out, but I didn't have time to do that. <laughs> Um, so I think I will stop there and, uh, and I'll, I think we're going to do some questions now. Thank you. Yeah, it's really uh, tough to take yourself back three years to think about what our mindset was at that time and what we, what we thought. Um, I think so many of us have maybe blocked, blocked that period of our time out. Um, so thanks Janine for that really, um, practical and informative talk. I, there's a lot of questions. I think you've actually answered a lot of them though. Um, through your presentation, but I think repetition is never bad. So we might just highlight a few of these and maybe we can try and do them maybe even rapid fire type of style here, Janine. So um, the first question, which is what you just ended on, I think is, will there ever be a time when we can stop wearing masks to see patients in our offices? And I think you kind of alluded to that, but why don't yeah. you? I mean, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I think that I think the thought is that, yes, we will get there and it will go back to eventually to that period where, you know, if someone does have symptoms, obviously you put on a mask, you put on your face shield, you put on your gloves and gown. Um, but if they don't have symptoms, they've screened negative, then we'll get to a point where you won't be wearing masks. Uh, my guess will, I mean, it could be as soon as this summer, but I would guess it would probably be more likely, you know, next spring, next summer after we've seen how things um, go over the next few months. But uh, I'm not the decision maker, so it, it may be sooner if, if um, you know, COVID numbers stay low. Thanks. And I know I will say that our Ontario College of Family Physician uh, colleagues are, are, you know, actively reaching out to um, experts at PHO and the ministry to try and get updated guidance for primary care settings, um, because we know this recent guidance was for acute care settings. So uh, we recognize there's a gap there and it needs to be filled. So there's a lot of advocacy behind the scenes. Um, so the next question is about, uh, is there what is the evidence behind the sixth booster for people more than 65? You, you spoke about this briefly, Janine, but maybe you could uh, reiterate and, and go a little deeper. Sure, yeah, so I can, I can um, add the link to the article. There's one nice um, study that was published, I think in MMWR in December, um, basically looking at those over 65 who had a bivalent booster versus those who did not have a booster. And there was about, when they, I've, got to, I've had to look at the stats again to know exactly what they did, but there was a 73% uh, reduction or additional protection in those that got the booster not requiring hospitalization. So a pretty significant um, impact in hospitalization. And that was just in the high risk group. So just in those over 65. Because um, when they looked at the group under 65, it was, there was, you know, two, the hospitalizations are too low to, to with a small group to show benefit. Um, but I think that's pretty strong evidence to, to indicate in that group that, uh, that, um, that a back, an, ex, an extra juice dose of booster would be uh, helpful in those individuals. And it's interesting, the people that we do still see hot in hospital, some of them have had, you know, fairly recent, like four to six months vaccines, but they they're very frail and they you know they may have had if they got a cold or a flu they probably would have been the same people that ended up in hospital so really for those people you just want to give them as much chance as possible and as much immunity as possible so that they don't um you know that they have the best chance of fighting the virus off so i think that booster is really important for those people so let's just stick with the theme of vaccination for a little bit i'm going to ask a couple more questions so um 
there's a question about healthcare workers and vaccination. So I think some of it is whether we're eligible for getting the vaccine and another might be, is it, are we expected to and or, or is it a good idea? So I don't think healthcare workers need a, another booster at this point in the, the spring um, campaign. Um, and when we were discussing with, when I was hearing then, you know, the NAFI discussions is, I think if you haven't had a booster since September 1st, so you, have, you haven't had your, well, I guess your fourth dose, then it would be a good idea to get it if you have not had COVID in the last six months. Um, I, you know, in terms of expectation, I think it's hard. There's just so much politics around COVID vaccine. I certainly would recommend it. So, you know, to get, if you've only had three doses and that last one was like, a, you know, more than a year ago in January, um, definitely important to, to get a booster. Uh, I don't think people need an additional booster unless you're in one of those high risk groups in the spring. And then it, going into next fall, if boosters are offered uh, for healthcare workers and, and people are about a year out from their last dose, I would recommend getting that, um, that booster. Yeah, now, you, I mean, if you haven't had COVID, it's always if you haven't had COVID within the last six months. Janine, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, even if it, um, so you're saying that if we've had it since September and not had COVID since, you know, sorry, if we've had it since September, we're not in a high risk group, not needed, um, but I think we might be eligible. So I, I believe you could go and get one if you wanted to. I think, I think that's what the Ontario, it's very confusing. And I, so I think you, I don't think anyone's going to turn you away. So if you really wanted one, um, you could go get one, especially if you missed that window and didn't get the bivalent um, vaccine, then you would be eligible for one. Um, but I, yeah, I don't think if you're a, you know, a young, healthy healthcare worker kind of in the under 60 range, it's probably not needed if you're going to go on a trip and you're going to be away for a while um, in, a, in a higher risk setting, or if you you know provide a lot of care for high risk people unmasked in close settings. Not unreasonable to get for sure. And so, some of your slides at the beginning of your talk referenced under vaccinated people as being a risk category. And so, a question about what is defined as under vaccinated. Um, because I think this, this physician points out that the WHO only recommends boosters for high risk. Yeah, so I, I mean, the people that we see that are higher risk, it's a combination of kind of the vaccines and also whether or not they've had COVID. So if they're an individual that has, I mean, obviously no vaccines, uh, that's high risk. If you've only had one or two vaccines and you're over 18 and you have not had COVID yet, I would say that person would be under vaccinated. I mean, most people in their 20s and 30s uh, have had COVID at, unless they've lived in a, in the, haven't left their house. Most people have had COVID um, at some point. So if you've had two doses plus COVID, you know, I wouldn't consider you under vaccinated. Um, but if you've had, um, if you're, you know, it, yeah, basically two or less doses um, and not, um, and not having COVID, or if you're in a high risk group, so anyone higher risk that we talked about, if you've had, if you haven't had a vaccine in the last, I mean, six months to a year, no COVID in the last six months to a year, then I would consider you higher risk as well. Okay. And just related to that, people who are immunocompromised, they should be waiting six months for their booster, not three months. Yeah, so again, some of the, it depends on how immunocompromised, like sometimes there's some special categories where people are able to get it sooner, but most of the data and most of what NASI has put out is, is now saying, uh, is saying six months. So we're going to turn our attention now to the new variants. Uh, so there's a few questions about that. Um, so maybe I could ask you if you could first comment about the new variant outbreak in India. Yeah, so I think, you know, with most of these things, information's evolving, it seems to be outcompeting the other uh, variants that were circulating. So when a new variant outcompetes the others, it's either because it's more infectious or there's some degree of immune escape. Um, so those are, we don't know exactly, uh, you know, what is happening and, and which individuals we are seeing it more in, but likely a combination of those two things. Um, I don't think we've seen a large you know, catastrophic increase in hospitalizations or ICU admissions and those things. So that's good. That means that there's some, you know, some protection. Um, and I think that, you know, with most of these things, we just need to we need to watch and monitor. And that's 
part of it, it, it would be nice to be testing a bit more so we could see which uh, variants are, are, are coming in, but we'll have to be doing that through people that are hospitalized um, and keeping on our eye on other settings. Um, and I, I mean, I think most of what we've seen is even though the variants have continued to shift, the vaccines have been able to still, vaccines and hybrid immunity have been able to still provide some protection. So it would be unlikely to see something that escapes immunity altogether and we're back to square one. Um, but obviously important to keep an eye on this. And I think the vaccine manufacturers are going to still have to keep just determining what's kind of like the flu vaccine where you're kind of predicting or you're seeing what the newest one and adapting to that. Um, and then, um, and then making sure that there's still ongoing protection in the population. So we're not at a, we never get to a level where we're back to where we started. Um, can you speak to the risk of long COVID with newer variants? Do we know if it's more or less or? I don't think we know. I, I mean, I, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of data coming out on long COVID, a lot of it's a bit messy. I mean, obviously it is definitely a real thing and we are seeing cases of it and I'm sure you are all seeing very many cases of it. Um, but I don't, I, I haven't seen anything that I would hang my hat on in terms of, especially the newest variants versus, um, versus previously. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. And just a reminder to folks that we had a wonderful session on long COVID not too long ago. So if you're looking for more information, I see a few questions about that. Um, check out our past recordings. Um, so uh, just building on the variants question, uh, somebody asked, can you please speak to new variants and symptoms of conjunctivitis in children and post-viral exanthem? Yeah, so again, I mean, we've seen some of these things reported that there has been um, more conjunctivitis associated with it. We did see conjunctivitis with the OG original um, Wuhan strain of COVID initially. Um, so, you know, I think that with most of these viruses, they can cause a variety of symptoms. Um, so I think definitely important to consider COVID in your, in your differential when that's when you're seeing that. Um, the other thing to consider is if they have Conjunctivitis and then rash is measles because our vaccination rates uh, are this is obviously not about COVID, but you know, certainly important to keep that on your radar because the vaccination rates for measles really fell off during the pandemic. And um, and we've seen a few scattered cases, and I anticipate unfortunately we may see some outbreaks. So to keep just keep that in your mind as well if you're seeing someone with a rash, conjunctivitis fever. Um, and then in terms of the viral exanthems, I mean. Again, with COVID, all throughout, we definitely saw some odd things, and it was hard to know, is this definitely due to COVID, or is this have something else that's related, but because there's so many cases of COVID, we're just having to pick it up as well. Um, so I, I don't know in terms of the, the rash aspect of a thing. I haven't seen anything that's, I'm sure that it's related to it or not, um, but conjunctivitis for sure makes sense that it would be, uh, could be a symptom. Great, so I'm gonna probably do three or four more questions and then we'll go to our next speaker. Um, and maybe I'll ask you then, Janine, to go into our, our Q&A and type afterwards. So uh, the next question is about treatment. So can you comment on COVID rebound after Paxlovid? And is that a con when considering giving it? Yeah, great question. So, um... I would, if people are eligible and it's an appropriate, you know, they're higher risk, I, I wouldn't hesitate to give them Paxlovid based on the risk of rebound. Um, if there's someone that's probably quite low risk, but they still technically would be eligible. So, you know, you have a 30 year old smoker who really wants Paxlovid. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend Paxlovid for that person unless they're completely unvaccinated and they're, you know, there's some other reason why you'd be worried. Um, and, I don't think rebound would prevent me from prescribing it to them, but that might be something that can inform the risk discussion with them if you're not keen on prescribing it anyways and would like to you know, tell them, well, there may be an increased risk of this. I mean, there has, there's, with rebound, um, there's been some reports we've seen rebound even without Paxlovid, but obviously the incidence is, is a bit higher with Paxlovid. Um, so I think the bottom line is it wouldn't deter me if someone was higher risk to prescribe it, um, but it may be something I would use to discuss with people if they were really keen to get it, but I didn't think that it was necessarily appropriate because they weren't really in a high risk category. Does that make sense? So, I mean, and there's also a question, I'm trying to find it now about, um, yeah, where do high risk patients access remdesivir? So yeah, so that's a great question. And I think um, I saw someone else at OH or the ministry be asked, 
that would be great <laughs> because right now we're actually having to admit people that need remdesivir. So there used to be um, infusion centers or centers through the CAC is in different places that were able to provide remdesivir. Um, but currently those, those places, I, I believe most of them have closed. Um, I fortunately haven't had to give anyone remdesivir in the last two weeks since things have shut down. So for, we, we've really had to admit them or bring them to emerge and then bring them back um, three days in a row. Um, and if it's a dialysis patient, we bring them there and we give them um, their two doses. So it's, it's kind of figuring out creative solutions with your local urgent care or acute care setting, which is not an ideal way to use those resources. Um, and um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I, we were hoping that, that the transplant centers, that most of the patients that would need remdesivir would kind of be higher risk and associated with either a oncology or transplant center because it would be because of their interactions may come up with something, but I haven't seen any, um, anything on that yet. So it's a great question. Yeah, so it sounds like the answer to some degree is uh, call your local ID specialist to see if they can help you. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, I think there's some some great comments there about Paxlovid, and I'll just um, remind people of the can treat COVID study that Andrew Pinto presented it um, in our January COP, and a reminder that they, you know, they're available by phone. Patients can call themselves, or you can refer. Um, they'll actually be in touch with the pharmacist who will actually direct mail the medications to the patients. Wow. Is there a randomized control trial? And the idea is to, to understand whether Paxil, what's, um, in what situations Paxlovid is helpful, understanding that there are many things we still don't know. Um, I also saw in the comments that um, indeed you can go to a pharmacy to get a booster. You will not be turned away. So there's sort of a difference between kind of what is recommended by NASI and then you know the eligibility criteria there. Um, maybe then the you know there's so many questions. So I will say it's one last question I'll ask you is what is your recommendation on boosters for those? Sorry, not that one. I wanted to ask you one. Oh yes, I wanted to ask you one about uh, advice for seniors. I wanted to ask you so. What is your advice for seniors over 80 who are going to events, family celebrations, et cetera, now that involve eat indoor eating, difficulty masking at this point in the pandemic? I think this is something that we sometimes get asked from that are from our patients. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very, you know, individualized um, answer and it depends on your patient. It probably depends on the event. I mean, I think that people are tired of missing out on important life events and, you know, kids' weddings or grandkids' weddings and that type of thing. So I think you need to have an honest conversation with them that they, you know, that they're, if they're going to that kind of setting, they may be at risk of getting um, COVID and the ways to make it, you know, a bit safer, they could still, they could wear a mask if they were mingling with people and if they were in an enclosed space, like kind of during like cocktail hour or something, if they felt comfortable doing that. And then when they sit down to dinner, you know, taking off the mask and enjoying because it's a lower risk environment if you're just sitting with, uh, you know, your, your table. Um, and then telling them if you do get symptoms, like here's some rapid antigen tests, do them, call me if you, if you, um, you get it. So, I mean, I think it's, it's a, it's a balance, right. Between doing the things that you love and, and being part of your family and having a reason to, you know, get up in the morning, um, versus being too worried about getting COVID. And, and we don't want to obviously see those patients in the hospital, but if they're up to date with their boosters, if they, um, you know, monitor for symptoms and, and get Paxil that it needed, the risk is low, right. It's not zero and they still, but it's very different than at the beginning when it was, you know, could be a, a death sentence. Um, so, you know, most of my close friends and family, I've told them go like enjoy life, but if you can do things to make it a bit safer, like wear masks when you're in crowded areas, you know, do that. And then at least you can still feel a bit like you're in control of the situation. I know I said the last question, we had a last one, last one, and then that really will be the end. And then if you could just go into the Q and A and sort by most upvotes, Janine, and then I'll ask you to answer the rest. So do you have this, this one is about vaccinating five to 18 year olds. And is there evidence and benefit of both vaccinating that age group who've had two doses and a COVID infection? Um, what's the risk of not getting boosted if they get COVID, the infection is usually mild and the vaccine doesn't protect against infection that well after two months? Yeah, so great question. So we don't have uh, much evidence at all, or I haven't seen anything, you know, life shattered or earth shattering or that I would hang my hat on that for above five, if you've had two doses and you've had COVID, 
I think for that group, it's a, you know, a discussion with the parents. I don't think that they would necessarily, you know, I wouldn't strongly recommend it. I would certainly, they may get vaccinated. Um, to me, with most vaccines, I, I always think what's the risk benefit. And so I think the risk and the side effects from the vaccine are, it's very safe. The, the risk is very low. And potentially the benefit is it will reduce the risk of uh, transmission. It will reduce the risk of them getting it and getting sick. If they do get it, they may have milder symptoms. Um, so on balance, yeah, I would choose to get them vaccinated if they, uh, or I would recommend a vaccination to a parent if they've, you know, they're more than six months to a year out from the, their COVID infection and they've only had two doses. Um, but, you know, would I, if a parent is very opposed, would I break the therapeutic relationship because of that? No. Um, but I do think, you know, that's with most vaccines, the risk of a child being hospitalization, hospitalized for most childhood illnesses is very low, but we still vaccinate them to reduce that risk further. Um, and it is also to help reduce transmission to those around you. So, um, you know, personally for my own kids, they're both, they're little, uh, when there is an additional booster, they, they got two doses and a, and a booster in the fall. And, you know, next year, if we haven't had COVID in a few months before, then um, I certainly will, will, will give it to them because I think it's a safe vaccine. And if it can uh, reduce that risk, and, and uh, even if we're going to see grandparents, I think the one thing I'd like to see more data on, but we certainly, from calling a bazillion patients and from some of the data we have, it, it seems to be if you are, if you're the source patient, so you have COVID and you're vaccinated, it almost gives you a little bit of lag time to kind of then isolate from people. So if you, if I come down with symptoms today and I isolate, it's less likely I'm going to pass it on to people. So um, versus if you're unvaccinated, we, from the early data, people were shedding high amounts of virus, you know, the two days before they were even symptomatic and the day of. So I haven't, we were, we're going through some of our stuff now, um, but I think that, you know, having those vaccines in you may actually give you a chance to not spread it to all your friends and family. So even that, I think, is a huge reason to, um, you know, to get vaccinated in those, um, those younger age groups. Thanks so much, Janine. So we're going to go move on to our next speaker, and Janine's going to answer some more of your questions in the Q&A. And uh, we're, just a reminder, we're going to 9.15 today, so we have the next half hour with, you um, Dr. Sarah Smith. So Sarah, over to you because we're going to completely change tracks here and think more about the day that many of us are entering um, after this call. Good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and so uh, I'm a family physician working in Alberta right now. And uh, next slide, please. So as you start thinking about your clinical day, I know your anxiety levels may be already rising, but I want to take you to the end of the day, maybe yesterday, and thinking about as you sit down at the end of the day, you exhale as the last patient leaves, and then you start looking at the work ahead that needs to be done before you go home. What are the top feelings that you're feeling? Now for this, use the chat box because we're going to blow this up probably with your um impressions of your clinical day and we'll use the Q&A box for the questions that you'll have for me at the end. So how are you feeling? What are the types of feelings that you're having within your clinical day? Next slide please. Yeah I'm starting to see some of those coming through so frustrated, resentful, it's too much, yep miserable, dreading. So I did not need a pandemic to burn out. I had achieved that status well early in my family medicine career and wanted to figure this out. Next slide, please. So my question, uh, next slide. My question to you, as you're thinking about your clinical day, you may have said these sentences to yourself or to your colleagues. Where do I even start? Does it ever end? I've never done. Will I ever figure this out? What's wrong with me? Next slide, please. So if we took your current clinical day experience and we fast forwarded you 10 years into the future and you were still having exactly the same experience of your clinical day, what would it have cost you? Or maybe you know already what medicine is costing you. What is that? Yeah, Aisha saying health, exactly. So start thinking about the answer to that question as we dive in. So next slide, please. 
So it's possible if you if you hear nothing else from me today, hear this. It is possible to be having a different experience of clinical medicine right now with the EMR that we have, with the patient load that we have, certainly with all the pivots that we've had through the pandemic, we now have a lot more work lists, portals with patients, email with patients, things that didn't necessarily exist before. But it is possible if you want it to be having a different experience of clinical medicine. Next slide, please. It probably feels like this though, that you're standing on the moon, looking at earth, trying to figure out how do I get back there? How do I figure this out? It feels impossible, like this enormous void from where you are right now to where you want to be. Next slide. Okay, so how do we start thinking about our clinical day? And it may not be right now in this moment as you're looking down the barrel of a busy Friday, but as you go into the weekend, perhaps, have a thinking about your day from a different perspective. Start stepping back from the busyness and having an evaluation of your clinical day. You are an executive decision maker. You solve problems all day long. You are very practiced at this, being the problem solver. But when we turn our attention to the things that we're struggling with and we give our brain great questions, we can come up with some answers that can help us. So the first thing I like to think about in our clinical day is our patient protected time. This is the time that we're seeing patients and closing charts. So that's step one of our clinical day. And then next slide. Then there's everything else. Now, for the longest time, everything else was just things that happened to me within my clinical day. I gave no thought to them, what's in there, what that involves, how long will it take, what else is buying for my attention within the clinical day. And you can answer this about your day. What is inside your clinical day? What is stopping you getting home on time with everything done? My passion here is to help you figure out a sustainable way of doing your clinical day for you where you are right now. Next slide. So what is the process? What are those um, concrete steps that we think about when we're helping physicians to plan for and make changes within their clinical day? So these are the quick four steps. We're going to go through them super briefly today so that you have an opportunity to ask me questions, but I like to at least give you a kind of a stepping stone map through the obstacle course of our clinical day. So step one, and I do not want you to beat yourself up and try and get to this point by the end of today on Friday. Just hear some of the suggestions and start thinking about how these could start to apply to you within the clinical day right now. Alan loves step one, but I actually, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are when I say step one is completing your charting after every patient. So Alan loves this idea, but what did your brain just say? Pop that in the chat box. What are you thinking about when I say that? I'm so busy, I can't do it, says Susan. Exactly. I cannot do step one, says Jacqueline. It's impossible, right? This is a moon to earth kind of distance. I'd be so behind schedule if I did that. Okay, step two is leading our clinical encounters. Step three is managing our interruptions. And step four is our exact plan for inboxes, work lists, and forms. I love all the objections coming in. And some of these are coming to hosts and panelists, so you can't see them all, but next slide, please. Okay, completing our charting. After every patient, even when the patient's coming in with a list, I'd be running 45 minutes behind. The wait time for patients would be increasing. All the things that you've come up with inside that chat box, these are the obstacles that you are immediately identifying as the reason this would not work right now within the clinical day that we have 
experienced right now, but that we're familiar with right now. Next slide. How is it possible? You're like, how? How are we going to do this? So we start to evaluate. So you are all in different EMRs. You've got different types of patient panels. You have different appointment lengths. You have different numbers of staff. All of the things are different about you. You are an individual. So these are some, again, of these questions that I want you to start being curious about. I want you to start to evaluate what is in my notes and why. So you are the boss. You know exactly what needs to go in that note. You need to record what happened your clinical reasoning, the pertinent positives, negatives, the things you need for insurance and things you need for billing. And what else? What else is in there? Are you somebody who likes to write prose and why? We're just starting to be curious, not with judgment, just curiosity. What is your brain telling you is more important than the note? And you will find the answer to this if you end this consultation and you go to sit down to do that note What do you go and do instead? Because what we do instead is what we have practiced and become familiar with. So when we're thinking about the patient waiting, we're compelled to go into the next room. And we say to ourselves, I'll do that later. Well, how many of us have any later? Well, how many of us enjoy doing this at 10 p.m. at night, right? So how and where? Could I get that note done if I wanted to? Interesting. And the reason I ask how and where is because innovation, you are an incredible problem solver. I have had physicians come up with amazingly innovative ways to get that note done. Like anything that saves you minutes and seconds, anything that helps you. So I've seen here templates, shortcuts, absolutely anything that saves you time because seeing the patient and the documentation is what we're being asked to do within the appointment schedule that we have created for ourselves, okay? And what stops you? For all those things you've put into the chat box that feel very real and very big, like a big wall obstacle, That's like an obstacle course. If we keep that goal in mind and we have said, which is my sentence that I said to myself, I do not want to do this later. I'm done with later. I don't have later. So now how do I want to start to figure this out? And we don't need the perfect solution the first time. Next slide, please. So for every obstacle, what is your most simple solution? As you solve for each and every one of the objections that your brain came up with, you will pass through this obstacle course and out the other side, getting our charting done. Next slide. Leading your clinical encounters. I heard you in the chat box telling me all about the referral letter takes too long. They come in with too many problems. They're complex, all of the things. So when I remind you that you are the boss inside the exam room, you are the one who is truly saying yes or no to each of the asks in the room. Every minute and second counts. What are we leaving the room for? Did we forget our stethoscope again? Now we need to go find the lidocaine or I've run out of this or that in the room. All of it matters. As we say yes, We're also saying yes to, okay, what are we making, saying yes to now that's creating homework later. As your patient gives you that form at the end of the encounter and says, hey, can you do this later? I don't need it done right now. And you take it, you're saying yes to later, aren't you? Who wants to do that form later? None of us. So what do we start to do differently? What are going to be your rules? How are you going to start to think about the language that you're using with your patients? The running on timepiece, do not think this is achievable within a few days. This is a long process. There are lots of moving parts within the encounter. But notice that you are the executive decision maker in that room. If you hear that hand on the doorknob question, but wait. I forgot to tell you, and you triage that as something I need to do that right now, go ahead. 
if you want to do five problems in the room, go ahead. You're the boss. But notice that five problems, if you are going to use all the time up doing those problems, you are now creating charting later. Interesting. And then the next part is now what? Now what else would I have chosen? If I was to reflect back on that, how would I have done that differently potentially? Next slide. Managing your interruptions. Who here has decision fatigue? I don't think there would be anyone here who doesn't. We make thousands of decisions daily. So an interruption adds to our decision making fatigue. Knock, knock, knock. Mr. Jones is here. He's 10 minutes late. Will you still see him? If you are getting that question inside your clinical encounter, your brain just went to this completely different place, didn't it? It just upset all of that high level work you were doing in the room to answer this question. You're like, okay, well, there's kid pickup today at four. I need to be out of here. So there's no way I can see Mr. Jones. I know how much he talks. So that's a no. But you just made all these decisions about your day. And then you come back into that room and you're like, where was I? Okay. So who did we need to tell earlier in the day? Hey, I have kid pickup today at four. You have my blessing. If Mr. Jones comes later, if anybody comes late in the afternoon, it's already a no. Just rebook them. Thank you. How can we start to batch your decisions? Even if you have no true autonomy over the staff, there's still ways we can start to be curious about our interruptions. Next slide, please. Your exact plan for everything else. So how many of us are doing that non-physician work? Because we got to that question at 5.20 p.m. when all of the staff have already gone home. Dang, if we'd got to that question earlier in the day, we could have flicked that back to somebody who could have rung that patient for us. Interesting. So what are we doing within our clinical day? That's because we haven't thought about the workflow and started to design a place where we could actually sit down and say yes to all of those things within our work list. So this doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have given yourself administration time. But if you have autonomy within your clinical day, start being curious. How long do these work lists take? What is a priority? So for example, in my morning, I say yes to doing script refills. That's my decision. I've said yes to my patient panel of doing script refills. Now, if I don't get to them early in the day, I get a reminder at noon. Thank you. So now I have, at the best, three extra clicks in that patient's file. So I want to get to them early in the day so that they're done and out of the way. That's less of the things I'm going to do at the next batch. If we come out of the encounter and we sit down to do that chart note and we click on the blinky thing in the corner that says, you now have 75 things in your work list and you open the first one and it's the five pager from the neurologist. You've been hanging out for that document. It's already, you know, a month late. Thank you. But you open it up and it's five pages and you're like, well, I don't have time for that right now. So you close it again. But instead of getting back to that chart note that you wanted to do, you open the next thing. You're like, Mary's hemoglobin slow. Like, am I expecting that for Mary? I don't know. And you go and look in Mary's chart or you're like, I don't have time for that. And you close it again. So now we're creating twice the work or we're kicking things down the road. So as we're sitting down to do that, we want to be able to say, yes, I have time for this right now. And we start to have a plan for how do I get these things out of my work list? Next slide, please. All right. So how do we create sustainable clinical medicine for ourselves? We start to consider what is discouraging about your clinical day right now? We stay curious, what changes could I make? Easy changes first that could create a sustainable shift just a little bit closer. What's the upside? Because change, as you know, as an adult learner, change is hard, uncomfortable, it's energy taxing. So what would make this worthwhile? 
what would be a good reason to start to think about changing up something about our clinical day? What would be the upside for you? And seek help. It's so much more fun to make changes with your community, with each other, with assistance. Whenever we're doing anything, you want to train for a marathon, how fun is it to get up at five and go running all by yourself versus catching a friend or catching a trainer or a training session? Okay, use that to your advantage. Next slide, please. Change is hard, but it's not impossible. We don't need to get to this point that this afternoon you're going home with all your charts closed, but if you take small steps and you let it be messy and you don't find the perfect way the first time you just try something new, you will start to move step-by-step step closer to goals that you have for yourself. Next slide, please. Charting Champions um, is the program that I run for physicians. It is CME uh, is inside. It's lifetime access. So this is a program that has tools, support, and community of your peers if you are wanting to work towards sustainable clinical medicine. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide. So these are some of the other amazing Canadian physicians who are helping you figure out sustainable clinical medicine. So we've got the Charting Champions program, which is the one I run at the top. If you're interested in boundaries around your uh, consultations, working with patients on the list, um, also think about triumphleader.com. That is our um, uh, one of the Canadian physician psychiatrists who runs that Ontario MD you heard from last time. 10 minute CBT for doctors can give you great tools for helping move your patients forward in their consultations um, with regard to making better choices or following advice. Um, and um, Noah Crampton, who is one of the physicians in Ontario, has is just releasing next week his in real time AI scribing. So I don't advocate that you do or don't need a scribe or you do or don't need to chart in the room you are going to figure it out for yourself the way you want to do it um, it's got to be your way not my way your way what's going to work for you but this is just my biggest upset about scribing is it creates a new work list for the end of the day where you've now got to see what somebody else put on paper for you so you or in the emr for you so in real time is going to be revolutionary. So there we go. That is me done. I'll have questions when you're all ready. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. And there's been a wealth of discussion in the chat. And if people want to put their questions in the chat, I'll try and keep track of them as well for this, just because there's been so much to chatter. Um, so many, I think your talk really resonated with so many of us. I will just um, say, you know, a personal story, a friend of mine, I think, watched one of your videos and she said like it really changed her life and then I was like what are the tips that you would really like recommend and the two that she she shared with me were number one and number three and uh in terms of trying to finish your charting in the day and yeah. the third and, and minimize interruptions and I have tried actually since since that conversation to put those in practice um it's not easy as as um colleagues are saying especially like um there are certain times where it is a long encounter, um, but I find for me, a lot of it is discipline because as I start to get more tired, I start to want to leave it because I've done the, the real work of seeing the patient and the work I don't like is typing it up. Um, and it's almost for me, it's about discipline to say, no, I have to do it right now. Um, usually I can do it in one or two minutes. Yes, sometimes there's a complex referral or something I don't know how to do, in which case I might send myself a message to do that later. It's intentional that I you know, don't want to keep my other patients waiting forever. Um, and then the minimize interruptions is a really interesting one because I now do ask residents and nurses to you know, actually just wait a sec before you're going to say this, or I just need one or two more minutes to finish this thought or finish this because, um, yeah, the interruptions are endless. Um, uh, in medicine and they really take away your bandwidth. So I just wanted to share here some of the things, I guess, from your talk that I think have really um, helped me. Um, Thank yeah, you. I want to, I want to ask you a question, follow up is what do you think was the thing that really shifted you towards wanting to do this? So actually saying, you know what, I I'm done with later, or what was your kind of, what were you noticing that helped you move kind of that ball a little bit closer to the mark? 
Um, well, I think partly it was my my friend's experience where she was like, you know, if if I I find that if I chart through the end through the day and I get to the end of the day and I just have my EMR messages, it feels fine. Mm-hmm. But if I get to the end of the day and I have charting and EMR messages, it just feels too much. And yeah. I agreed with like that assessment and I found it myself. And I think many people have said in the chat that. Um, you know, it's, it's also really hard. It's hard to remember. And I think she, she mentioned how, and I, this is true for me. It's like, it's just much faster because you're on the plane, you know what you're going to do when you're seeing the patient. And then to remember that later, you're more likely to make mistakes, it takes time to just do the recall. So it was more efficient. I don't like making patients wait. So that is a tricky piece, but I, but I think if I have the discipline, I can often make sure I'm doing it faster with that caveat that I sometimes do send myself the to do if it's a longer referral or something that I need. Um, yeah. So, and just to remember that that referral. Um, so, when we're saying we get to the end of the, the the consultation and everything about that consultation is done, all of the everything's the referral letter, the billing, the chart, like everything done, I and mean, then moving on. That referral letter is of high value to the patient, right? And it takes time doesn't it, to get those referral letters done. And I'm not saying, remember, I'm not saying do this today. This is not what you take home. Take home today, it's possible to have a different experience in clinical medicine. But having that patient in the room, seeing you referring, this is an important part of today's consultation. If you have decided that it is, if you say, yes, I'll refer you to five different people, I'll do that later. How excited are you with yourself at 10 p.m. when you're doing that work, right? Or Saturday when you're referring people. So if you're in the room and you're like, I I agree, going to the urologist is our next step. Let's do that together. Pull out the letter and do it right now. Remind me, patient, how much surgery have you had before? How long have we been having these symptoms? When was your last CT? Or just say, pull out your phone, get busy with it. I'm going to do your letter. This is an important high value piece of this encounter. And it's done. Patient, you are now on the list for the urologist. Not, I'll get to that later. And in about a month, you'll then go on the six-month wait list, right? So the noticing, I'm saying yes to, but I can't give 30-second medicine. That's not high value. What is high value is we need to get this done right now. Do you want it done right now or do you want me to deal with your knee? Okay, and the language that you're using, don't use my words, use your words. What do you and how do you talk with your patients um, about, okay, we're going to do this right now. And I want you to bring that back so we can do a high quality work with that next time or whatever that looks like for you about this. Just starting to notice what am I saying yes to that I really am grumpy with myself later and how can I start to change that a little bit? Um, I saw some um, comments here about delegating. So yes, using our teams. Absolutely. What are we doing? Keep being curious. What am I doing that's somebody else's job? And how do I start to teach them, communicate with them, pass that on, and then watch the quality of work? Because as a physician, you will not use that tool and that person if you don't trust them. So making sure we're creating those strong teams and safety nets for our patients for sure. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And and yeah, you're right. I started to do that more to fill out referrals with the patient. Um, I will say sometimes I still leave some things. And one of the things I I think we've also done here is started to explore tools like e-referral and consult. But I will say those take time to integrate and learn into your practice. And so you kind of have to set aside time to do that. Yeah. And um, it's an investment in your future though, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's going to take you time up front, but it's going to save you minutes or seconds in every for the rest of your days. So thinking about, is this of high value if I get this right? Yes, that's worth pursuing. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, I noticed, you know, some people voicing frustrations about the number of prescription renewals they get and also just the setting of boundaries and how that can be really tricky. Um, just also shutting up that, you know, I think that's, there is actually a gendered part here as well, where I think there's studies that have been done that show, you know, patients expect their female physicians to take more time with them um, and actually bring more of their stuff um, to them uh, from an emotional perspective. So, uh, so, you know, you're, I can imagine, yes, you are feeling that people are bringing a lot to you 
uh, and mm -hmm. setting boundaries can be difficult. I don't know if you have any other thoughts about the boundary piece, Sarah. Yeah, so boundaries, um, again, that running on time piece or that um, the, the uh, saying yes in the room and how we're going to talk to patients, just allow yourself the grace to get it wrong, to let it be messy, to make things changing just a little bit. Don't be, um, when we come out of the room and we're frustrated, take that opportunity to exhale and get the note done. So you're not carrying that consultation forward through the next three weeks until you're ready to chart it, right? Just bang it out, get it done. A plus doctoring, B minus charting. Okay, little tip and trick. Um, and then I, that's why I mentioned that 10 minute CBT, because he's awesome at telling you that empathy is sucking your life away. And so it helps you say, how do I notice my empathy and then move the patient a little bit forward towards helping themselves? So that's just was a really nice little CME um, that we uh, kind of reflected to our members that they might be interested in. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's some really interesting comment here in the chat. Um, from a, a colleague who says, you know, I complete charting during the visit. Um, and as I'm ge generating the referral letter, I say it out loud to the patient. They mm -hmm. seem to like it and correct some of the details in real time. Mm -hmm. And the part that I found interesting here, I also don't open my inbox other than 8 to 8.30, 12 to 12.30. So, so they actually let mm -hmm. set them to leave the room to eat at that time. And then 4 o'clock. And that was been a game changer. Um, and then exactly. So that's that prioritized for work lists and forms. So that's a really good example of how would you like to do the work of today? So today's work. So uh, when we're looking at that answer, that's looking at what is coming in today. So you've got to make sure you're thinking about what's kind of hanging over from the last few weeks. That's backlog, which is different from today's work. So if you know that Today's work can be completed from 8 till 8.30, 12 till 12.30, and then 4 till you're ready to go home. Like you could say, I am out the door at 4.30. Is that giving myself enough? And then about those inboxes, what's taking my time? And so I'm seeing here that that referral letter, that portal, that for each of the types of referral letter, that's taking my time. And so for from my perspective inside my clinic, we actually have a dedicated person. I write the letter. She uses that to fill in the dang form and attaches the letter. So I do not do the, which form do they need? And how do I fill in the form? We actually offload that, like use my letter and come to me with any questions that are specific that I didn't answer in the letter so that I can help you complete that form and get it done. Okay, wow. so how can we offload that work? Lawyers have paralegals to fill in their forms uh, so how can we start to harness the people within our clinic what are they doing right now and what could be more helpful to you mm -hmm. just being curious about that just thinking about who could I be who would I want to employ next for instance what am I doing within my clinical day um, that I could start to harness that towards uh if I paid someone to do that that would be a really good use of my time or three of us could pay for one of those and that would be a really good use of my time just that stepping back from the busyness stepping back from the busyness you want to bill like a lawyer too so the billing piece so we are under earning when we're working at night most typically we have earned the money in the room with the patient and as we work at night we're diluting our income you don't want to work out your hourly rate. Honestly, you will be very sad. <laughs> okay. So mm -hmm. just taking that noticing and then saying, what do I desire? If you want your evenings and weekends back, go for it. Honestly, go for it. Decide that impossible is worth pursuing. Yeah, some so such great tips and people are really, I think this presentation resonated with a lot. I'm going to put um, a poll up actually for our audience here, just as we're about to close out the session. We try and plan these sessions to meet your needs. And so you'll see a poll with two questions. The first question is just about whether our community of practice should continue to have COVID updates at every session. And you can choose from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And the next one is, as you may have noticed, we've started to put more topics that are relevant to helping physicians reduce administrative burden and um, uh, get more joy from work, uh, increase office efficiency. 
And so if you want us to continue with this kind of trend and these topics, please let us know, write strongly agree. And, but if you don't, write strongly disagree. So please do take a moment to vote in the poll and I'll let Brian uh, close out the poll when he's had enough responses. I love that Ali said he started to look forward to the forums because he uses the extra money to buy himself presents. So whatever makes it feel, feel good. Um, some great other tips from our colleagues, um, some tips around uh, asking your uh, admin staff what could actually make things better um, because they're a wonderful resource. Uh, somebody actually is also saying just even taking the time to come today was something that they did for themselves uh, and that they're so glad they did it because it feels good to, to do something that's going to help you. Um, all right, Brian, can you show us the results of the poll here? Yeah, so. It looks like um, people mostly want to have COVID updates, um, but some people are not not as sure. But uh, looks like uh, lots of people strongly agree uh, and agree with also the um, focus on reducing administrative burden. So that's really helpful for us. And um, we'll send a more detailed evaluation out. And I wonder, so Sarah, I want to just thank you so much for your talk today. Um, Brian, are you able to bring up our closing slides here? I'm just going to go through a few things quickly here at the end uh, for folks. Um, I wanted to actually, can you go back a few slides, Brian, to the, the resources? Perfect. Um, Mahalay, I didn't leave a lot of time for you on this. Sorry about that, but I'll turn it over to you to speak about it. Yep, no problem, Tara. I can be brief. Um, so I just wanted to quickly touch on the Ministry of Health announcement. So after some advocacy from the OCFP, we saw the uh, $30 million investment to fund 18 primary care teams. Um, many of you have been asking about um, the expression of interest. We're expecting that later this month. And once we have more information, we will share that with our members. And of course, we'll continue to advocate for equitable access to team-based care because we know that has been uh, quite, quite a challenge. Thanks so much. Um, next slide. We'll go to um, the next slide is actually just about um, two, new quality, uh, two new resources from Ontario Health. The first is a new quality standard on eating disorder, um, just outlining what good care looks like for eating disorder, providing some practical recommendations um, and, uh, and, some, and there's a, a webinar that's uh, associated with it that is accredited um, if you're interested. Uh, next slide. Um, there's also an updated Lyme disease clinical guidance document. I've actually used the previous version of this clinical guidance document and found it really helpful in the clinical encounter even to provide to patients as explanations for decision making. So this has been updated now by OH and PHO. Um, please do check it out. Next slide. Um, and just to say that the next practicing well session is actually related to eating disorder. So a really uh, a great way to kind of consolidate your learning. Next slide. Um, so as you so thank you to our speakers today, Janine McCready and Sarah Smith. Uh, very different topics, but both equally useful. And uh, th thanks to Janine, who actually went through and answered, I think, every single one of their Q&A questions. So that might be a record for us that all of those were at answered today. And then um, thanks, uh, Sarah, for just being uh, incredible in terms of uh, connecting with physician colleagues and allowing us to, to feel some hope and optimism about our practice and giving us some practical tools to do that. Um, thanks to all of you for attending and to our, our staff for making this possible. Uh, our next session will be on May 5th. Um, we're planning a focus on vaccine preventable illness on, on that day uh, with updates, for example, on the new um, uh, NASI guidance on uh, pneumo vaccination um, and um, some other updates as well. Uh, and of course, you can access um, the, our resources or tools, Q&A, uh, at, on our website. The video will be posted later today, so you can re-watch Sarah and get re-inspired <laughs> um, if, you, if you'd like to do that. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you in a few weeks.